Hello teachers, today we're going to talk about how to teach Reverie by WC. Sounds like this. It's such a beautiful piece and the title of dream or reverie or sometimes my students think of it as a daydream is so appropriate because this piece really takes you to a different sound world um, and you can imaginatively enter any kind of dream or daydream um, as you play this piece and as you guide your students to play this piece. This shows up in several collections which I'll link in a Sheet Music Plus list in the description of this video. It's on RCM level 9, and for my Illinois colleagues, this is on our AIM syllabus level 11. So I think the main features of this piece are just the beautiful lyricism. And sometimes, especially in WC's later works, such as the preludes, we don't get as many beautiful melodies and pieces that are just straight up built on lyrical melody. And I think that's why many people gravitate towards this piece. It has that beautiful melody, but it also has some of the early, lush, interesting harmonies of Debussy's mature style that we find later on. All right, so what do our students need to be able to do or execute or what do they need to know in order to play this piece well? Frankly, Debussy didn't write anything easy. All of his works are um, filled with all kinds of difficult things technically as well as musically. I do think besides a couple of other little things like maybe the Little Shepherd from Children's Corner, this is one of his easiest pieces. But I would strongly encourage you to prepare for this type of piece with um, something in an impressionistic style such as Jennifer Lynn's Le Petit Impression, which are beautiful pieces. Um, and also I would highly encourage you to not have this be your student's first piece with the polyrhythm that is three against four. That is probably one of the classic difficulties in this. So you wanna make sure that your student can do something with that polyrhythm before you play this. Otherwise measure five is going to be a disaster and you're gonna spend all of your time in lessons rehabilitating that rhythm. That said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the polyrhythm, but I do want to say one of the best practice techniques for this particular example um, is to omit the ties over the bar line in the left hand. I actually think the tie is one of the things that makes this the worst and the most difficult to play. So if you practice it, without the tie at least a couple of times to feel that they line up on the downbeat, that can certainly help. My other little tip is that I find with my students when a polyrhythm is out of joint, um, that it's usually a problem in the triplet the three um, part of the rhythm and not the eighth or, or the four, <laughs> whatever the other side is. And so students need to be, um, you need to be listening and students need to be aware that it's very easy to make a triplet into long, short, short, or short, short, long, and elongate either the first or the last note of the set of three. So we're gonna move on from the polyrhythm now, but I, I do realize that it's something that students do struggle with. Uh, just like the first arabesque, we have several arpeggiated left hand parts, uh, such as where we begin in measure 11. Or the bigger ones um, in measure 19 and on. That's just an F7 um, chord but it's not you know, just straight up. And it includes a G in there, so maybe it's a F9, not an F7. Anyway, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you do have to think about what's the best fingering for your student and their hand size based on uh, how fully grown they are, as well as what fingering is going to allow them to play with a beautiful, soft, and relaxed mechanism in their left hand. The dynamic at measure 19 is pianissimo which is true of much of this piece, it's soft. And so when you, whenever you're starting with evaluating fingering for your left hand arpeggios, make sure that it's something you can do without bumps or without fast attacks and jerks in the left hand. 
Uh, one example, personally, I prefer in measure 23 to use a standard left hand B flat arpeggio fingering, which I don't find printed in editions. So I don't know why um, I differ on this, but I prefer to do 3 1 3. Because I find that I can play that softly, but that might be different for other people's hands. Okay, uh, students need to know that there's a key signature change in this piece, and I have found that when it does change to E major in measure 59, a lot of students miss notes in that part, and I don't know if it's just that they only have, you know, the two lines in E major and they don't practice it enough, uh, but that is typically a problem spot for my students, so I would uh, encourage you to address that early on. Um, Beyond just the fact that we do shift key signatures and there's a few modulations, there are interesting harmonies. A lot of seventh chords or even almost expanded jazz harmony chords with nines and things like that. And so it might just be worth analyzing a few of those so that your student knows, oh, that's that interesting note in this harmony. That's what makes it sound special. That's why I keep messing up. It's because I'm not expecting that particular note to be in this chord or this arpeggio. It's not as out there as a lot of other Debussy, so that's one reason why this is a good introduction is because it is simpler in many ways. One of the other things that I think students need to be prepared for in this is shifting all over the keyboard. The range is quite wide, which is one of the reasons that we love it. Um, but there are a lot of times when you have to move very quickly, and some of those are at a piano dynamic. I think of the place at 27. <laughs> the fortes you can just you know move and drop into it quickly but getting to the pianos is harder and that's a spot where I would probably have my students do stop practice where they play the two measures that are forte stop take a rest breathe play the measure that's piano at a really good piano dynamic stop breathe and then play the forte part uh, without having to go straight into it and then you can just make those stops or extra rests smaller and smaller until they're really not there anymore. Uh, the other classic place for students to really struggle is um, when we go back to the original key signature at 76 and the melody shifts between the hands. So I always make sure that this is one of the things I point out to students first because it looks very simple on the page and it is actually quite difficult to coordinate. If I play just the melody, and let it be in the hand that it's supposed to be in, it would sound like this. And that's what I make my students do first. Then instead of adding all of the accompaniment parts, the eighth notes, I just have my students add one hand. So maybe they play the melody and just the left hand accompanying notes. said just the left hand accompanying notes etc I would have to practice that myself to make the voicing really beautiful um, it is it is tricky because it just keeps moving back and forth and of course in general throughout the entire piece you're gonna work with your student on voicing out the melodic parts which are frequently in the right hand but also show up in the left hand so measure 35. Ooh, that is such a lovely chord change right there. Um, it's even better the second time. Mm, to that lovely augmented chord. So your students are gonna wanna know those really well, where they're going. They can always do backwards or back it up practice to get into those chords smoothly, smoother than I just did right now. And then the last thing that I would wanna cover with my students in this for a really beautiful and effective performance is Debussy's specific dynamic markings. Like I said, so much of this is soft, so they do have to be able to play with a very relaxed mechanism in order to play softly and with that very delicate, dream-like tone, um, but also you just need to clarify um, what he means. In measure 11, when W.C. writes meno piano, 
that means less piano. So to me, that says I'm actually going to play that just a little bit louder. Um, and so you, you want to just make sure you're not just thinking meno means less. Uh, likewise, or alternatively, in measure 57, Debussy writes pew piano, which means more piano, which I take to mean as softer. So those are some things you want to look for with your students. I did pull out before I made this video my little book, uh, The Piano Works of Claude Debussy, which much of this book focuses on theoretical analysis and kind of figuring out why we enjoy the sounds of these pieces, what's going on harmonically. Uh, but I love this quote from Debussy that he wrote to his publisher, I regret very much your decision to publish Reverie. I wrote it in a hurry years ago, purely for material considerations. It is a work of no consequence and I frankly consider it absolutely no good. Well, I'm very thankful that Debussy's publisher did publish Reverie because I've had so many students who have enjoyed it, who've been able to emotionally connect with this, and um, even their families have loved them playing it because it's just so beautiful. So I hope I've given you a few tips on how to teach this, made you think about how to teach earlier Debussy works. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel, and I wish you all the best in your teaching.